Hello, welcome to this open Aperio 21 plenary session. I'm Ian Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Hyten, Assistant Principal and Director of Learning, Teaching and Web Services at the University of Edinburgh. If you're not familiar with the University of Edinburgh, it's the sixth oldest university in the English speaking world. It's also an Aperio member institution and a prime mover of our incubating Faisan project. Melissa has a strong commitment to multiple facets of open education and is here today to outline some perspectives on a theme which I think will run throughout the event, open education on a post-pandemic planet. If you want to ask questions, please use Twitter or speak up on the screen in front of you. Uh, Twitter hashtag OpenAperio21 will reach us. And with that, thanks very much for being with us, Melissa. I will adjust the screen to show your slides. Thank you. And make you the presenter. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you all for the invitation to present at the conference. Um, I'm not sure if I can see the names of the of who's watching um, down the left hand side. So I'm not quite sure how many of you there are. Um, but uh, thank you very much. I tuned into one of the earlier sessions and it seemed very lively. Um, and I tuned in to see um, Duncan from Edinburgh talking about my ed. And he uh, described University of Edinburgh as big, de devolved and weird. Um, so with that, I mean, that's a pretty good, um, pretty good description of us. Um, it's we are members of the Perio Foundation uh, for many years, and we uh, a, a good part of our business is based on technologies supported by Aperio or by the open source uh, community in general. And that's um, something that I'm very pleased that we do at Edinburgh. It's definitely part of what our business is. And I'm going to talk about um, some of those things. I hope that that will be interesting to you as to why we do this and why we spend the time on it and how important um, I think it is. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you um, to Philippe, who's going to do the translation into French for us. Um, I hope that's successful. I have flagged a couple of Scottish words in the presentation, so hopefully um, we'll be able to get the translations fine with that. I'm very happy to be here talking about this um, topic and the I love the presentation was given to me by Ian, but I thought I'm going to stick with that. I like the idea of talking about um, the post pandemic planet, because I do think that um, this is these are big topics um, and it's something that we are all in together and conferences like this that draw people from all across the world that are about sharing ideas and sharing practice are really important to how we take a planetary wide approach, same as you might take an institution wide approach, we need to be taking a planetary wide approach, I think, um, because this is um, a strange time to be working. So I'm going to um, hopefully be able to uh, navigate through my slides, but I got these, um, this nice graphic design done for me by uh, one of the graphic designers at Edinburgh. And it's, uh, I liked it because it seems to be looking out um, to just think about what, what might be coming and what we can see from where we're standing. And I think that as we try to predict the future um, of what might happen, there are a few things that we can still hold to be true. Um, open educational resources, open source software, open access digital tools, I think are our our best hope, possibly our last best hope for um, equality and access and inclusion in education. And these are under attack and, um, you know, should not be taken lightly. Uh, the active, the, the active and proactive work we must um, do to protect, uh, protect that as part of our ecosystem. So education must not be dependent on digital platforms controlled by private companies. 
um, and large educational institutions like Edinburgh um, must show their support for open sharing and collaboration and assurance of accessibility for all our audiences. And I hope even when I only really talk about University of Edinburgh, that maybe other people will be inspired to talk about how their institutions do it or perhaps um, copy and, and share. So we, you know, we have to make decisions, a deep reflection, I think, on how we purchase um, technology for our universities, but also the skills in our education technology teams, the people in our, uh, in our teams. And we need to think about how we grow that understanding of open literacy within our teams, uh, within our curriculum, and within our pedagogical training that we deliver to so many faculty. And this is essential, I think, as we struggle to fight against the denial of scientific knowledge and to fight misinformation and to rethink and decolonize the curriculums that so many of the northern universities still teach um, and to care for our planet as a planet. There's, there's much work to be done. And I'm really pleased to be able to have the time to tell you uh, some of the things that we are doing. So this is, you know, a great Scottish word out with. Um, this is about the University of Edinburgh has always been an uh, organisation who have looked out of looked globally out. Uh, we are a huge online learning provider, um, and that's always taken an outward view. And we're steeped in the history of Scotland spreading enlightened views around the world, um, even as we struggle locally with our independence and secession issues at home. Um, we continue to take a, a global view of the kind of education that we do. And I've put a few links um, in here to just tell you a bit about the size and reach of what Edinburgh does. So we, Edinburgh is in a very small country in Scotland, um, but we've been doing online learning for 15 years. We've been, been in the business of massive open online courses for 10 years and seriously into the business of open educational resources for five years. And the, the links there um, give you more information about that. And I'm happy to answer any questions about those. But I think those are you know, understood areas that um, uh, universities are getting into. I think more universities are piling into the online learning um, area now. And I would always want to encourage people to balance their online learning activity uh, which is often closed and elite and expensive um, with the open educational resources activity, which is about open and lowering barriers and getting as many uh, materials to as many people as possible um, in that uh, kind of open uh, practice way of thinking. So, when Ian gave me the title of the post-pandemic planet, I was thinking about how we describe the way things were before. And there's this um, lovely phrase, the before times. And uh, this is this is a, a phrase from, from the Bible and from Star Trek, which of course are both canonical sources. But it's I think it helps us to think about the ways our world was um, a lost world from a time before a catastrophic global event. And I think that science fiction literature is actually uh, worth revisiting uh, right now because those are the kinds of places that discussions about um, what we knew from the world before and how we change and approach and recover, which is something that we're going to have to do over, over many years. But um, not all was lost. And we did know uh, some important things before we started on on this um, this current journey. So it's worth just thinking back to what we knew um, in the before times. So in the before times, we spent a lot of time thinking about technology futures. Um, we thought a lot about the platforms that we were going to invest in and the partners that we had. Uh, we thought a lot about open sharing and collaboration and accessibility for all our audiences. We took positions 
around our ecosystem, what technology we have in our universities and how those work together. And those are ethical positions. And I think that a lot of those ethics remain the same. And I think that you have presentations about learning technology ethics um, coming up later in the um, conference. But um, I see the University of Edinburgh's commitment to open source technologies as an ethical uh, position. And we are committed to various open source uh, tools at the university. And we're committed to Drupal and Uportal and WordPress for our web estate, um, for Kaltura, for our media management. And we consider open source in all of our procurements. And this is you know, often difficult to negotiate uh, within that sort of wider ecosystem, but it's a it's ground worth holding, I think, and important to make sure that our processes and procurements uh, welcome uh, open source options. And we mention it in our job descriptions when we were recruiting to roles within the technology teams. We make clear that uh, we encourage and want to um, uh, promote the idea of working on open source tools and we support open access, open science, um, open educational licensing with with training and with policy so that it's not a niche, uh, poorly understood area. Um, there is a lot of acronyms, as Duncan mentioned earlier, but uh, we try to, to promote understanding as well. And the reason this is so important to my business is that I need software developers in my organization who will push frontiers and find new solutions. So I, I, that, those are the people I want working in my university. And I want to attract them and I want them to stay. And I need diversity of thinking in my creative teams. And I want staff to feel supported and valued. And I want them doing interesting things to solve real problems. And I know that people who work in open source development are values driven. So I must invest in areas which showcase and make clear the role we play in leading these values. And one of the ways that we do that is in partnerships with organizations and platforms like edX and foundations like Aperio um, and Wikimedia. And the reason that I need people who think in this way as part of my organization is that these are essential freedoms for higher education. So the autonomy and the freedom of thought that universities are founded on, we need to reflect that in the way we do our technology. And we need to have control of our own data and the ability to shape the technology to the way that we want to teach. We should avoid ever having to say, no, you can't teach that way because the technology won't let you. And these are freedoms worth paying for. I think that we all understand that often open source has a higher cost of running and supporting, but it means that we can pick and choose features for our services from across the open source development community. And obviously where nothing exists, we can build our own and offer that back to the community. So when we buy in services, it's not so easy, as you know, to build really flexible extensions for bought in services. Um, and the systems may allow some extensions, but they can require fairly unique skills and can be quite limiting. It's, it's much easier when we have control of the code um, and all the data. And what I enjoy um, is that even if the open source community hasn't built something that's exactly perfect for us, um, often you can take something, um, find something close, tweak it, um, and that saves save time even from developing from scratch. And that sharing back through the protocols that are, surround um, open source code and open educational resources and open licensing, I think is really um, important. And the time that it takes, you know, this is still, even though people say that open source uh, costs more money, the, the huge price hikes 
that we've seen from commercial vendors this year, um, I think, you know, raise questions about to whom we give our money and, and why. And even if they weren't raising license costs um, for their products, the amount of storage I've needed this year, the huge expanding collections of born digital learning materials and recordings um, that we have at University of Edinburgh this year is growing a rate of knots. I mean, I would say that more, more items have been added to our collections of teaching materials than to our university library this year. The learning technologists are increasingly embroiled in collections management. Um, and the metadata around these materials is shocking. Um, to my shame, I now have 200,000 new media items called things like lecture week one, lecture week two, online recording and such, because whatever title the individual faculty member chose before they named and um, uploaded their files onto the media asset systems. So they all <laughs> didn't really think about the scale of the institution when they were doing that. So again, a uh, big devolved and weird. Um, but our job and Duncan's job, um, we need to care for and curate and move and store and keep these items for the future. Um, and some of you may have heard me uh, speaking at um, open educational conferences before about technical debt, um, licensing debt. Uh, my future now increasingly looks like a pile of metadata, metadata debt. Um, and the metadata mess is rapidly mounting and will need attention. Um, I would think, uh, in the immediate future uh, from our teams. So thinking about open educational resources, um, we have, um, as I say, five years of investment now um, at University of Edinburgh. Some people would say we were doing it longer than that, but um, there was a little bit of open washing going on in the university uh, previous to that. Uh, people declaring the materials were open educational resources, but the, the licensing, when you actually looked into it, wasn't quite clear. So we brought a, brought a bit of rigor to this. Um, and I am a bit of a purist um, because I do want to talk about open educational resources. Um, I mean materials that are clearly licensed for reuse um, with a Creative Commons license on it with only the minimum of caveats. And I mean hope, hosted on open platforms. And I think that sometimes people get, the discussion gets a little bit confused by phrases like um, open educational practice or um, open pedagogy approaches and stuff. but. Uh, for me, in the kind of role that I have um, in terms of looking after systems and collections, um, I really mean uh, quite specifically openly licensed materials on platforms. Sometimes I have to put them on external proprietary platforms, but I also make sure that we host all of our open educational resource materials on our own platforms uh, for reuse and sharing, because I want to ensure I want to make them discoverable. I want, and I want to count them and I want to show them off and I want other people to use them and I want to celebrate that use because that's the return on my investment. And I want to reuse material from other places. So in addition to however proud I am of the work that we do at University of Edinburgh in creating and publishing OER and giving to the community, I'm equally proud of the way the Edinburgh teams consume materials released by others. It shows the value of sharing and it actively challenges the ideas of silos and not using materials which were not invented here, which is one of the most troublesome issues in higher education and prevents us from decolonizing and diversifying our content. So thinking about how other people might use your materials and how you can add new value to theirs is the care that we need to take right now. 
value is added to open materials by every reuse. And the kind of um, practices that you all understand in terms of supporting open um, open source software. Uh, I think that there's we can really learn a lot of the same lessons about how we take materials from other places and reuse them and change them and share them back and add things. And this is, as I said, very important for the autonomy of institutions, but also for the much larger community of, of sharing in higher education. And I think it's about, there's something there about saving the planet. So one of the things that has not changed is that we still have to tackle catastrophic events. And our platform, our platform, our planet is in crisis. And we must think about what the universities should be doing in order to, to think about and tackle um, these catastrophic events. What's the right thing for a university with a global reputation and some considerable resources at its disposal? to be doing at a time of major geopolitical change and uh, climate crisis. These things have not changed. And what we do, how we educate our students, how we bring them with us, how we tell them that this is important work um, is modeled by the way that institutions behave. So governments and institutions are increasingly aligning themselves with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And there's 17 of these, I'm sure you're familiar with them. They're referred to as the UN SDGs. I think it's important to remember they're not all about um, the green and energy consumption. There's a whole bunch of them, the 17 of them, that provide a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. And open education, open educational resources is one of the, is clearly mentioned in the UN Sustainability Goals, access to quality education for all, uh, redistribution of wealth in education through the open sharing of materials and knowledge. So open courses and open educational resources play an important role in supporting these sustainable development goals or goals for sustainable development. And the University of Edinburgh have put in three links for you there as well. I'm just going to talk a little bit about these areas of work. So our approach to developing digital education um, opportunities champions the fourth SDG to ensure inclusive and equitable education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. As learners anywhere in the world at any stage of life can gain access to free, flexible, accessible materials on a broad range of subjects. So that doesn't have to be the same as opening up all University of Edinburgh courses to anybody who wants to take a degree. What's important is that we think about the ecosystem of the materials that we have and make large swathes of those. A good chunk of that stuff needs to be made open for sharing. But also we can do the kind of work that we need through activities like MOOC activities, which already reach hundreds of thousands of people, to do courses about sustainable development and to do those courses in ways that they are sustainable. So that first link on this slide takes you to a mapping of our short courses at University of Edinburgh against the sustainable development goals. And some of these courses are translated into multiple language versions so that they can welcome people from all over the world into studying them. Some of them are about sustainable development. Some of them are contribute to sustainable development. All of them are openly licensed and many of them are made using materials from elsewhere, which other universities have released. So they're recyclable, they're recycled, reused, adaptable and free uh, for reused and adapt and free to study. 
So we, I would encourage you to have a look at, at um, that list. There's an excellent um, set of, of topics. Um, and what I'm particularly um, pleased with is that we will be running, um, we have uh, something called an event MOOC, which is a particular type of MOOC that the University of Edinburgh is particularly good at, which is that we run um, a MOOC alongside a major event. Uh, we sometimes do that around UK or Scottish elections. Um, we did run uh, various ones about this, about Scottish independence um, and one about Brexit. But um, what we do when we do those big MOOCs is we provide a platform for people, for members of the public to engage with the topics and with the academic experts and various um, public intellectuals um, on, the, on the topic. And we will be running one of those um, uh, event MOOCs for COP26, which is being hosted um, in Scotland, admittedly in Glasgow rather than Edinburgh, where you can't have you can't have everything. So we, so University of Edinburgh, will be putting up um, uh, event MOOC to support um, the discussions and engagement around that event. And another example of how our open educational resources have helped us uh, to respond to major planetary events, of course, is our um, COVID MOOC. And there were many universities who put up a lot of COVID material, and I'm not saying that um, Edinburgh was the only one. But the, the speed at which we were able to publish a massive open online course about frontline respiratory care was facilitated by the fact that the materials we needed for that course were already openly licensed from within one of our other courses. So we have a master's in primary health care that had a module all about um, respiratory care. And because of the time that we had earlier invested in knowing what the licensing on that material was, who had created it, where all the diagrams and images had come from, and having that released and releasable meant that we were able to take materials from that internal, expensive, closed master's course in public health and make a chunk of them available um, on FutureLearn um, as part of this um, short course uh, open to the public and for free. And the turnaround speeds, uh, this is one of our most rapid MOOCs, um, and it brought obviously the University of Edinburgh um, considerable return on that. So I, I don't mean financial return, I mean obviously <laughs> reputational and con uh, contribution to tackling the crisis. Um, and I think that that's one of the examples where knowing your own materials are reusable, um, and then reusing them within your own organization really brings um, benefits. And all the materials, uh, because they're openly licensed, now that we've put them up into that course, um, other people can, can use and take and, and share. And the, the third link actually there is um, to some of the instructional designers uh, thinking about um, how they have reused material from other places. So I have a number of uh, media teams who usually would be out and about filming content uh, to make to be part of the University of Edinburgh um, online courses and MOOCs. And of course, with COVID, they were all confined to barracks. So the materials that they were using, the video that they needed for all of the uh, to be part of the university courses, they had to source from elsewhere. And so the trailers. Um, and the content, much of the video content and the trailers for the sustainability MOOCs are made from recycled materials that other people um, have, uh, have released generously. Um, and that uh, kept us in business, basically. We were able to make these wonderful pieces of media because other people had generously shared and we were able to uh, just get access to a range of images and videos um, to give a global slant on the um, courses that we were making. So have a, have a read of that and follow up if that's of interest. So the um, other thing we, we do um, is to think about uh, grow your own open thinkers, because as I've said, it's so important. Um, to have in your organization people who understand these open approaches um, and the rigor of open materials. 
and I see that as uh, technologists, learning technologists, and students, um, and members of the university. So it's really important to think about um, how we embed uh, in the teaching that we do uh, that sort of understanding of uh, skills for researchers and knowledge activism, the ability to contribute um, to open knowledge from all of the members of our university. And we do this at Edinburgh in many different ways, but um, one I wanted to tell you about, and again, I've put links for you here, is that we partner with uh, Wikimedia. And uh, Wikimedia, Wikipedia is one of the largest open educational resources on the web, as I'm sure you know. Um, yet so many people uh, seem to be largely unaware of how it works and what the community of people who look after it, um, what they're actually doing. Um, and we've been you know, working on this for about five years at the University of Edinburgh, and it's a slow burn. Uh, we've been working with academic faculty across the university for five years. We have a Wikimedian in residence, and we work to embed Wikipedia, Wikidata activities into the assessed curriculum. Because it seems to me essential that graduates and faculty at universities should understand how to participate in open knowledge creation, understand how knowledge is created and shared and contested online. And it still surprises me. People who know me know that I am still surprised that so few universities um, actively engage with this as an area of skills development, um, inf information literacy, um, and knowledge activism. But um, as long as everyone else perhaps isn't doing this, then I'm very proud to have it as a um, leadership area in the University of Edinburgh. So we have a Wikimedia in residence. You can read about that project. We have a range of examples of Wikipedia in the curriculum. So this is assessed work activities into the curriculum. Um, and we have trained 1,300 students, 525 faculty, 484 random passing members of the public who have attended the workshops that we're doing. And when we think about how something like Wikipedia works, the participation level, getting more people involved in this, is absolutely what we need to be doing. It's less about one person editing many, many pages, as many people each editing in their own areas of enthusiasm. And the more editors we can create, the more active knowledge uh, participants we can create, the better. And I'm very pleased uh, to see that every week, members of Edinburgh University are contributing. I think that members of Edinburgh University are one of the largest groups of contributors, certainly in the UK, uh, to Wikipedia. Um, and I'll, I'd be interested to hear anyone who thinks they've got a larger group from any organization anywhere in the world. And you know that there are structural problems in so many areas of technology. And one of them um, with Wikipedia is that um, women are not represented um, proportionally in the uh, either as editors or in the content. Um, and so one of the things that we do at Edinburgh monthly, as you would expect for Women in Red, is we meet um, at Editathons and we just hack away at that. Um, and that, that link yeah, you can go to, you can just see the events that we run every month, um, just tackling the gender skewed topics um, and coverage in Wikipedia. And you're very welcome to join us uh, if you would like to. As I say, members of the public are welcome. So just to say a bit about um, what's going to happen now. So resilience and hybridity are very much the, the topics of the, of the day. High tech teams switch to home working relatively easily. I think 
certainly at University of Edinburgh, and that's partly due to prior investments that we'd made personally in the IT kit setup that we have at home. And there's a good chance that we already had a good chair, camera, headphones. It's a privileged position and our institutions benefited from that. I was in awe and thankful for how well my teams moved to working from home, barely skipping a beat. Our services were up and running. But if we think about how employers and cities and nations respond now to hybrid working, it's suddenly an urgent area of leadership. And for a small country like Scotland, perhaps we can begin to reverse some of the brain drain if, if people return to work from their home home. Uh, maybe they'll come back and live back in Scotland. And perhaps through our unions, we can gain better industrial relations. Uh, I think that people appreciate the, the flexibility that employers are suddenly able to show about where you work. Um, and it will benefit high skilled workers and the benefits may not be experienced equally. And most of the world's work is not cannot actually be done from home. But it's possible that we will see some disruption in the traditional structural inequalities in our sector, our tech sector. Um, and we will see uh, some disruption to the way that universities recruit, because there's going to be much more opportunity for one spouse to take a job somewhere else without having to uproot whole family and in the past women um, suggesting that they would move to a different career or a different job risked uprooting their children and from schools and um, local elder care and I think that the opportunity to now perhaps work uh, from anywhere might do something to address the key pipeline which sees women dropping out of tech and stem jobs at points in their lives where they become mothers and again at menopause. So this may be mitigated by the shift away from presenteeism um, and toxic um, office conditions. And it gives us the opportunity to diversify our teams. Universities were already an international market and we can now hire from anywhere, but we are going to need to work harder to be attractive. So in closing, I want to say thank you to several members of my staff who contributed to helping me think about what I might say um, at this conference uh, today. Um, and some of the people on the slide are here at the conference. Um, so I just wanted to say, to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm ha really happy to take any questions about any of this. And I hope that these stories from Scotland about how universities are rising to the challenges will inspire you to keep working um, in this really vital area and try to predict for the future um, based on what we remember from the before times. So thank you very much. I'll stop for a moment. Melissa, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, anybody got any questions? We have a couple of minutes before people move off to their, their next virtual sessions, which are the Solutions Expo. And our next plenary is at half past noon Eastern, uh, half past five UK and half past six, sorry about that, Central European and South African time. Um, I'm guessing that others have experienced an explosion of resources over the last 18 months in the way that you've described. So what's your thinking about how to pay down that metadata debt and how far have you got with it? Well, it's so it's interesting because, um, you know, the. It, it flags a skill uh, that perhaps we didn't realize was so important, which is the, the naming of files and um, how colleagues uh, describe their work. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see if we can tackle um, how we manage these collections. I think we will do better next year um, going forward and how we look at helping colleagues to reflect on the materials that they uh, made this year. Some of it is going to come through the need to spring clean or some, we're gonna need to clean a lot of this stuff out because the storage um, that is required for keeping these things um, is expensive. 
And so I think it does, we will be in conversations about whether digital assets are short life. You know, born digital may mean not kept forever. Um, and so those uh, choices that we might make about what to keep, what's really important and what was only ever supposed to have a six month life or a, a year long life uh, will involve some yeah, engagement and reflection, uh, particularly around the needs to delete and clear in preparation for another coming year. Indeed, just squeeze one more in from the from the audience from Jim Halwig at Wisconsin Madison. University of Edinburgh has clearly got a huge commitment to open source. Does the University of Edinburgh have an open source program office or is that something you're thinking about? I'm not sure that I know what that is. Well, <laughs> strange, strange you should mention that because we do have a session that Saeed Chowdhury is giving on Wednesday about open source program offices. Think about it as a universal interface between the institution and open source communities. And quite often it's about getting an institution's IPR out there and used. But I think it also plays the other way and could lead to an institution getting a more coherent perspective on its relationship with open source. I think I will come to the session and if it sounds like something that I should definitely have, I will set about trying to get one. Thanks very much. We're a minute over. Uh, please handle further questions on Twitter. There's Melissa's uh, Twitter handle on the screen. Thanks to everybody who attended. Like I say, the next plenary is in about 45, 40, 50 minutes. In the meantime, please use the Solutions Expo. And thanks again, Melissa. Thank you all.